So, um, Net SNMP is, um, as probably everybody of you knows, is the dominant toolkit to implement SNMP on, on, on Unix. Um, and it's basically, it's, it's applications, SNMP work, command line applications mostly, and um, libraries. Um, it's got a master agent, SNMPD. It's extensible. You can uh, write modules in C, which uh, um, include via the DL, DL open system call. And it's got uh, some other extension mechanisms as well, SMAX Agent X in particular. Um, it's basically, it's a C AP. Um, it's got its template generator MIP to C, so you can, um, if, if you're focused on C, you can just um, give it a MIP and it will, you will just call MIP to C on it and it will generate a, um, um, a, a, a template for your own agents, so you don't have to, to, to write everything yourself, you just fill in the missing pieces, etc. But it's C, obviously. And, um, well, the agent architecture it uses internally is beyond this talk. So why Python? Um, my ex boss told me so. It's a plain and simple answer. Um, could have been Ruby as well, but so it came Python. Um, NetSNMP comes with a Python module. NetSNMP, Do. Um, it's quite a large pile of, of, of C code um, that abstracts the whole C API into, into an object oriented approach, but it's uh, client code only. So if you want to do an agent, you're stuck. Um, so basically, the idea is um, we just take the C API and we access it from Python with C types, um, imitating agent X sub agents written in C. Um, I'm not the first one to have had that idea. There's a module on SourceForge called Python Agent X, um, but it had some design issues and it looked rather often to me. Um, I did some patches initially, but uh, after seeing them not being considered for, for, for weeks and months, uh, I just thought, well, uh, dump the whole shit and rewrite it myself, so I understand it. Which is, of course, an attitude which is uh, well known among uh, developers. Just do it yourself. Hello, Python that is an P agent. Um, it's pretty simple, actually. It's just two source files. Um, one um, has all the C type stuff, which means um, prototypes, as we would say in C, um, which webs the API called, just 13 kilobytes. And then um, on top of it, this netsnpagent.pi, which is um, the file with the classes. We would see about that. Um, and it's also not, not, not quite large. But it's extensively commented, which explains why the real code size is one third less. Um, I've got example MIBs and agents included. What I mean coding style, um, it's not particularly PEAP8 or whatever the Python coding style um, proposal is. It's more or less my own coding style, but it's consistent. And it's been tested with um, both 5.4 and 5.7 versions of NetSNMP for the simple reason that um, it was targeted at enterprise Linux distributions as they call themselves, SUSE and um, Ubuntu. And they're still shipping 5.4, so I have to take care of those as well. Let's look um, how we would implement an MIB. Um, this is basically the um, ASN notation, how, how you um, construct MIBs. You just give it a name. Um, you just tell it a data type. In this case, it's an unsigned 32-bit um, Scala value. Um, Max access, et cetera, is not so important right now. You give it a description, and um, you give it a reference where in the SNMP MIB tree you want um, this object to appear. So this simple scalars one translates to something like dot one, dot three, dot six, etc. This is a quite simple example. It's just an integer value which we want to, to, to make available. Um, you could have, um, you can also do tables, but that's way more complex. But I support it, of course. So if you have a MIB like this, this is merely a declaration. You're just saying, um, you're just merely constructing a tree of information. Um, you don't have the code yet. And that's, of course, the intent of using my Python SNP agent module. So you write some Python code, you put an import statement in it, 
and you just import the one file with the classes, not the API calls. Um, and you construct a new object of type NetSMP agent, which uh, needs an agent name, which NetSMP um, requires internally. Um, and you give it a list of uh, MIP files. In this case, the MIP file we just um, defined. Um, NetSMP requires that, um, for example, so it can translate internally between um, symbolic names and the numeric OIDs we've just seen. And so you create an agent object. Of course, you do proper exact exception handling, unlike here. Next thing you do, um, just because you've um, declared a, a structure in the MIB file, um, doesn't mean that all those um, information elements uh, have been appearing magically. You still have to explicitly register them, which makes sense because you could have two agents implementing different parts of one MAB file. So you come up with a registration. Um, I've got sort of a class factory um, here for the different data types. In this case, integer 32. I thought it was unsigned, right? There you go. <laughs> Whatever. Um, and you give it the, the OID where this integer um, should be registered below, so inside your MIB tree. Once you've done that, you've registered all your um, SNP objects. I'm speaking of SNP objects because you could just as well register a table. A table is basically rows and cells of simple scalar values. Um, once you've done that, you call agent start. Um, that makes it actually connect to the master agent, SNPD. Of course, you do proper accept share handling again. And then um, your agent basically looks like this. Um, this is a simple example, of course. Uh, you've got an end endless loop. Um, you call agent check and process all the time. This is, in fact, a net SNP library call. Um, they designed it this way. And as I said, I'm just wrapping their API calls. Um, so we have to do it this way as well. This example, I could, um, for fun, um, update the integer value I just declared and, and, and double its value all the time, provided I would have initialized it, or give it a, its value or whatever. And um, I could call an SNMP set from the command line um, and see the new value appear here. Um, this is very simple. There are, of course, more complete examples, um, for example, of tables in the source distribution. And a real-life agent is, of course, also much more complex. So the agent I wrote for internal use is like 120 kilobytes, 3,000 lines, um, because you want to do all the fancy stuff like uh, demonizing and, and, and log for logging and whatever. Right. Um, if I have time, I'll do a short demo in a, in a second. Just so you know, there's some things missing, of course. Notifications and traps in particular. So um, you can't... As of now, you can't write an agent which informs the master agent, um, for example, of a fan failure or anything like that. API documentation, who would have thought that? And um, maybe some unit tests, because as I said, after all, we produce safety, right? So it would be, of course, nice to have um, the elementary software modules um, have safety as well. I'm going to give a real short, quick demo. This is the examples directory of the uh, source distribution. And we've got the simple agent here. If you look inside, this is all the things um, we just saw, basically. Scalar values, different um, data types, and also tables. And um, the nice thing is you just run the script. It sets up everything necessary to test the whole thing, like um, calling SNMPD. Um, is isolated from the rest of the system. So you can actually run it with a system-wide SNMP instance running. It even says uh, at the top what the commands you have to run. And it dumps the current values of all those um, variables. And so I can go ahead from separate shell, just give it the command like, like uh, take this MIP I have in this directory, connect to the instance on this port, because as I said, it's separate from system-wide SNMPD. And it gives me the values. And I can do things like, um, um, like I, I can also access the, um, the tables. If I had the right um, OID, that's no, first table, all right. So in this example, it's some 
well, should be temperatures or anything like that. Um, and I could play around with SNMP set as well. But because my time is up, um, questions? Sorry? How much more overhead is there in Python next SNMP agent than there would be implementing agents in C? In terms of what? In terms yeah, of. Repeat the question. Yeah. The question was um, <clears throat> how much overhead um, a Python implementation would be compared to C? Uh, in, in what terms? You mean in like, like uh, one speed or? Uh, well, we currently use next SNMP C agents as a base for our product. And I'm thinking of re implementing it in Python to simplify some of the agents. It's basically it's a, it's a, it's a wrapper. It's it's very close to the C API. So if you if you have ever delved into the um, the details of the C API, you will recognize uh, much of it. Uh, then again, as, as as you saw, it's it's pretty abstract. You just give an agent, create an agent object and register some variables, and and, and you're done. Um, as as for the overhead, I haven't benchmarked it um, for the simple reason that um, writing the same in C, the same agent I had to write um, was no option. So I, I have no comparison, but um, overall, um, I haven't seen any performance issues so far, because Python is actually quite fast. Um, uh, we're running out of time because the next talk has to start. Yeah. So uh, yeah. thank you, Peter. Come to me afterwards. And any questions? <laughs> any questions? Um, chase him out um, outside the room. Um, the next talk will start just in a couple minutes. Right, um, for the next talk, we have Graciendas, which will talk about the Linux configuration collector. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Graciendas. We will give a talk about uh, config uh, to HTML, which in fact is a Linux configuration uh, collector <laughs> of one of those. Um, maybe an interesting point is the uh, main author of the config to HTML project is in the room. It's Raul. Uh, it's better? Is it better? Okay. Okay. All right. So we can start. So you may wonder why do we need config to HTML? Well, it's a plain shell script, in fact, that collects everything from your system system parameters, IP configuration, whatever you want, whatever we configure or put into the script, in fact, can be collected into a big text file or a big. HTML file. That's the main purpose of config to HTML. You can see it as a fact as a complete system documentation set. Um, it's very handy to have it off-site or at the central point. Um, for a lot of customers, we do it. In fact, um, that at the central, central point and NFS uh, mount point, for example, that we collect all the system information. And when there is an issue, we can always go back to the configuration settings and see what was uh, what kind of hardware it was it, what kind of memory had it, and all parameters of the clusters, etc., is in there. The nice thing is about config to HTML, as it is a pure shell script, it does work on Linux, it works on HPX, AX, Solaris, and even on other uh, Linux and other HPX or Unix like Unix uh, systems. I found it very useful for everybody. 
from system administrators to system engineers to designers, whatever. And the nice thing is, it's open source. It's a GPL version 3 license. OK, config to HTML, as usual in open source, is not the only tool available. Um, the main, there are three main uh, competitors, in fact. Uh, it's the Sysconfiguration configuration collector. Um, it is a nice tool. It has a web interfaces. It also collects, but the way it collects is not very easy to collect it on, for example, to put it on a CD, to put it on a, on a central point, because it's a different kind of uh, collecting. It's uh, more or less you can compare it from the day before, what has been changed from, uh, you can compare two systems, for example. It can be very handy, but um, in case of disaster, for example, it's less useful. It's my opinion, huh? but it's a very good tool. Then you have also an, an quite old tool, the Linux Explorer. It was kind of uh, uh, what does access for Solaris. It is uh, something similar. It is more um, a tool that you can use for if when there is a problem, you collect all the kind of information, you give it to your su support supplier. And the same is true, in fact, for the OSCS inventory server. It's, um, it's an open source, but it's more in hardware collector. So, okay. So, you can see it as a proactive or a reactive uh, kind of tools. Eh? The, the reactive support tools, which are highly feel, are available on the market, are yeah, Suzy has them, uh, Rail has them, uh, HPX has kind of AX. But it's, as it said, it's after the facts. Eh? When you have a problem, you collect your information, you send it to the customer, and then they have their kind of view, so they can see what information does the system have to, uh, to reveal the problem. And then you have more proactive, and that is where the config to HTML is really fitting inside. Uh, you collect it in front of having any problems. When you have a problem, you can go always look uh, over there. I even have a set of older um, uh, snapshots effect from every week. I just keep them and, uh, and wrap them up every month in one big one, and then put it aside. So I can always have a uh, one-year history of every system. That's going to be very handy. It proved its value a lot to me and to the customers. Config to HTML is not a new tool. It has been around since, uh, I think, uh, started end of uh, last century, 99, something like that. Uh, I have been using it in the beginning of the 2000s already in my previous projects, um, like uh, make say, drum recovery, it already had it included or when the current project, Relax and Recover for Disaster Recovery. I think it's one of the tools that you must have if you want to think about disaster recovery. This is the history. It has a lot of tracks, branches, and um, now we are currently busy with uh, the sixth version. Uh, it is merging, in fact, the Linux and the HPX in one big branch, and we are looking also for the Solaris and the AX uh, to, to bring it as along to the sixth uh, branch. So where you can get it, quite obvious, you have a main website. Um, it's maintained by Rolf. There is also mailing lists. It's also ma maintained by Rolf. It's quite old. There are a lot of history on it. And um, the last uh, six version is on the GitHub. Uh, you can just uh, clone it and start working with it. And there are also um, issue trackers. Uh, I, I do like the issue trackers of it, GitHub very a lot because I, for me, it's the main tracking of all issues that I have because this is not the only open source project I do. Uh, otherwise, I just lost myself in all the emails I get. Uh, so that's, uh, if you have an issue with it, just make an issue tracker. How to use it? It's quite simple. You have to be root, uh, so you can use sudo. There is a uh, help facility with the main h uh, uh, variable. And it, you just, can just run it and it will collect your information as standard, uh, very wide and very open. So there's a lot of information in it. So just run it and you will see where you come out. Um, it tells you in the headers where the information is stored. So you don't have to think where is it. It, it just tells you where it is. Okay. Um, as it is now for the version 6, there is a main script. It's all bash or corn shell, whatever. Uh, and there are collector scripts. And this is only for the Linux, because it, it can vary a bit from HPX or Solaris, for example. 
uh, as for Linux. Uh, in Linux, we use the user share config to HTML, where we put all the collector scripts, so everything that we want to collect or um, we want to add, it's over there. The main script is the same for all the versions. Uh, is it for HPX, uh, Linux, uh, Solaris, or AEX? It's always the same script. It's a wrapper script. And then the configuration. That's something new, in fact, uh, because um, that's something that I introduced, in fact, because uh, you can collect your information. Well, let's put it reverse. Uh, I always mount an NFS share point where I want to collect my information on the central point. That I described in the local.configuration file. It's just an NFS source. And then you have the default configuration. You don't have to modify it. If you want to modify something, just copy paste it in the local and just modify it over there. Because the local configuration file is always the last one that is read. So that is the ruling one. All right? Here you can see a very simple sample. As I said, you can see it on the top the HTML output file and the um, text output file, you can see it where it is stored. Uh, for Linux, by default, it's under the slash var slash log directory. But you can change it. You can overrule it on the command line. You can overrule it in the local.config file. It's very easy. For the rest, it tells you when it starts, etc., etc. And here it tells you what is it collecting. Uh, of course, this is only a small screenshot. Uh, it can be 10K long. so. It's a bit too long to list it. Uh, I don't want to run it here. Uh, it's up to you, the customer, just to try it out. And uh, it's a very easy program, but it's a very handy one. This is a text file. You also have the HTML variation. Oh, no, this is the text file. Sorry, that was the run file. This is the uh, example text file. You can see it's, uh, it's, the screen is too small. It's only on top of the header one uh, of what it will show. It, the simple things that it will collect. And the next screen is, in fact, the HTML view. And that is linkable. So you can really click on it, and then it jumps to the section that it collected the output from. OK. It's all modifiable. Uh, you can add stuff. You can modify stuff. Um, if you add some new stuff, it's, it's also very handy to tell us. Uh, if you find uh, things that are missing, make an issue for it. And then we can discuss it. That's the way that Ralph and I are dealing these days. Uh, and more and more people are uh, getting uh, into the, or finding, would say, the issue tracker now. And that's very good. OK, the source tree. Uh, already said that config to HTML has a main script that's uh, on the top. And then you have, in fact, uh, a subdirectories, or underneath it. Uh, for each main operating system, we have a separate directory. That's the, the new style. Uh, everything for HPX will go under the HPX tracker. Uh, uh, only some here, the Linux tracker. You can see it. Uh, it has library, etc, documentation, packaging. So we do the packaging, the RPM DEP uh, packaging is possible. Um, and the main script, config to HTML, calls the Linux script. And in this case, it's the config to HTML dash linux.shell. And there is the starting point from everything that is for Linux point of view, of course. And that's true for all the other uh, operating systems. Uh, beneath it, uh, you can't see it very well, but it's JIT clone, and that is uh, how to clone the sources. And then you get this view. Okay. Uh, what is still missing is the AX and the CELOS. But these two sources will be added soon. Uh, as we are looking for uh, new active developers. We're getting feedback from the internet, but uh, it's not completely uh, on the speed yet. So we want to get uh, that going very soon. I already mentioned the configuration files. Uh, the main configuration file, the default.conf, uh, is in the etc config to HTML directory. You shouldn't change anything there. You can look at it, and you can, uh, if you see, OK, I want to modify something. Copy it in the local.configuration file. And um, <coughs> I listed here, in fact, the, the main use of the local.config file by me, uh, personally on the customer side, is the output underscore URL. That is the way you can just mount um, an NFS share, and you can collect everything on one central point. In fact, that piece of code is coming for Relax and Recover. Uh, it's one of my other projects. Okay. 
As I said, it's an ongoing project, and the main purpose of this talk is, is to find volunteers that uh, are willing to assist us in any way possible by using it. It's also an, uh, an a good way to start, by giving us feedback, by helping us writing uh, documentation. Every small piece is helpful. Uh, by adding uh, or helping us with the AX and uh, Solaris uh, support, or just improving it because it's a bit old. As you can see, the AX is from 2011 and the last one from Solaris was 2012, so it needs some updates, I believe. Uh, also, the integration in the new six track is uh, required and needs some uh, good-minded uh, people with knowledge on AX and Solaris. So, please step forward. There's still some time left, I would say, for questions and answers. Uh, uh, Rob is any here. questions from the audience? We'll pass the microphone around if there are any. No? Uh, well, okay. I very clear. guess that's <laughs> it. If you uh, come up with any questions um, later on, yeah. you can still chase them at the front of the room. We are or still here. Uh, outside. In the and, uh, okay. Well, thanks for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. And the next talk will start in a couple of minutes as well.